Thank you, Fumeza. I think everybody probably has a lot of compliments and comments and questions for you. But um, first, we'll hear from Steve, because he also has a really um, compelling story about why we need to do better on TB drug development. Um, Steve Bradley is a UK-based TB survivor and an advocate with TB Alert. He serves as a member of TB Alert's peer-to-peer -peer support network. A former tube worker who then went into project engineering, Steve does not know when he contracted TB, but was hospitalized after returning from working in Australia in 2008. Steve suffered severely from adverse effects of TB drugs following a delayed TB diagnosis. He was given the standard first line treatment, leaving him blind and without feeling in his legs. Steve, I'm gonna pass you the microphone. Thank you very much. Thank you, first of all, for inviting me and getting me to tell my story. Um, it did start in 2007, 2008. I was offered a job in Australia, so my partner and I decided to uh, basically emigrate to Australia. I was an uh, electronics project engineer and I was going to work for Globecast. So we, uh, before I went, I had a slight swelling in my side here. I actually had private health insurance at the time because I was working for ITV, a, a TV company in England. And they diagnosed that uh, I had a gland swollen and some antibiotics would get over that. So off we go to Australia. I get to Australia and I suppose looking back, I become symptomatic. I have night sweats, I'm losing weight, um, generally feeling ill. But the whole of Australia's doctors and hospitals could not come up to a conclusion. I have a massive lump come up on the side. They drained this lump several times, told me there was nothing, they couldn't find anything, HIV, et cetera, et cetera. The funny thing was, to get a visa into Australia, you have to be TB clean. It's part of the visa. So the year before we moved to Australia, I was actually checked for TB and clean. When I went, uh, as I say, to the doctors in Australia, nothing positive come out of anything they tested me for. So I said to my partner, we've got to come back to the UK because it's just not, you know, they're not finding anything. So after a 24-hour flight, he demanded that I attend A&E here, which was probably the last thing I wanted to do, but um, I attended into a local hospital into A&E. And they said to me, I'm not too sure how to prioritize you. And I said, well, if you don't get something now, I'm gonna fall down because I'm just so ill. They took me in and uh, they took me in for an x-ray. And within a minute or two, this nurse came up and said, that man's got to go into intensive care now. And I looked around and thought, well, who are they talking about? <laughs> Suddenly, I had 20 doctors around me. They were trying to get blood out of my feet at my groin, all sorts of things, all these machines around me, all sorts of things. Had no idea what was wrong with me, and basically, after a few hours, placed me into a ward. I had infusions of antibiotics, anything that they could lay their hands on, it seemed. I was woken up all night, and I was just never, ever told what was wrong. So it just went on and on and on. This went on for over 10 to 15 days. And a matron came up to one of the doctors one morning and said, he's got TB. And they went, oh, don't be silly. That's how much recognition we get still about TB. I get nowadays, it went in the 50s. That's the attitude we get. I was tested. I had a man to test, and it came back with TB. Suddenly, I was whipped off into this pressure ward, uh, pressure room. So I was in a ward for all this time, making everyone else ill, then suddenly they decided I needed masks on. Everyone coming in needed a mask on. So it was very frightening to be put into that sort of regime. Meanwhile, my partner, who obviously we were, you know, even sleeping together, had not even been tested. There was no sort of, oh, who have you been with, with family and all the rest of it. And luckily, I had also seen people from Spain when they were tested in Spain, they were immediately put on first-line drugs. That's not something we do in the UK, but that's a side thing. So I was decided to be put on the regime. Now, obviously, I hear about this regime that we have as a standard regime, romanfacin, isoniazid, ethambutol, et cetera, et cetera. And yes, it cures a lot of people. But what 
I never was told is what it can do to people. It's that or die. My partner was told I was going to die. You may find this amusing, but we got married. I was allowed out for half an hour to go and get married because I was going to die. So we had the situation, I had the three or four drugs given to me straight away. I was allowed out. Why, I don't know, because I was in a wheelchair with scarves around me and all the rest of it, very ill. I was allowed home. I was laying on the floor, and I had a nosebleed. Now, this went on for about four or five days. I attended again A&E. We're talking the NHS here, so, you know, you've got to stay with me, so it's not private health insurance. They decided they would put lolly sticks up my nose and try and stop this blood and I had this thing around my head looking like a rabbit. They decided at that point that it couldn't be anything to do with the drugs I was taking. There was no relationship to the drugs I was taking, but there was a problem with the nosebleed, and they didn't know why. Romanfacin had taken all my white cells away, so I couldn't clot. There was a direct relationship to the drugs I was taking. This continued on. I said I, I had bad legs. My legs were hurting. Isoniazate does that, sir. We'll give you some, I think it was B6 or something, and your legs will be all well and good once you stop taking the drugs. Again, I'll tell you about that further on. I was very ill, and this is the thing with the social side of uh, TV is that you have to understand you could be the only breadwinner, you can easily go downhill very well, you're losing weight, you don't want to go to work, you can't go to work, and you are a person at the end of the day. And I felt so ill, I couldn't see very well. I didn't know whether I was out of focus or what. I didn't really care, to be honest. And at that point, I saw a professor of TB in London, at the Royal London. And they looked at my eyes, and stupidly, they rushed me off to uh, a ward and filled me with vitamin B6. They accused me of being an alcoholic. Not the relationship to the ethambutol I was taking. The ethambutol had starved my optic nerve of blood. I have a white optic nerve now on both eyes. I have very, very limited vision, which is counting fingers, and I have some peripheral vision. That happened in two weeks. I had a 20-20 vision to no vision. I was registered blind in two weeks. That's how TB affects you. TB, I am now an advocate for sorting out the regime that I was on, which most of you are saying is still there as your backup, and I understand that. But what we've got to understand is the person at the end of it. Please tell them the side effects. It's not you've got to frighten them, just to warn them. I'm here to discuss and show you what happens when you get all of those effects all at once. And I'm sure it doesn't happen that often, thankfully. I do know three people that have gone badly sighted this year in England because of East Amputal. And I think that's unacceptable. We're trying to find new drugs, and I think you're doing a fantastic job. TB hasn't been cured for a reason. That's because it's very hard. We've got HIV under control to a greater extent. It's been funded. It's very well funded, in my view, and maybe it's flippant. It's, it's a very sexy thing. It's very acceptable. TB is not acceptable. It's got a big stigma. Some families don't ever talk to their family member has had TB again. They're just ostracized because they've had TB. My sight, as you can tell now, is very limited. And the only good thing out of it is nickel. I've got nickel now, as you know. You've all seen him. He's lovely. But I don't have any independence. I don't work anymore. So if you can think of just one moment of losing your sight and losing your ability to be a partnership anymore. You might be married, you might have partners, but you suddenly say, 
I can't drive. I can't do my half of the relationship anymore. That's not what you signed up for. It's not the person you signed up for. So not does TV just affect you. It also affects your life, and it's affected my life forever. So it's the whole thing is I need you to sort of understand when you're with that patient to be as sympathetic as you can and understand that when they do feel ill, they really do feel ill. And the side effects and understanding that they could happen, just let them know. I was put on at the end streptomycin, which I would think this lady would have done because of the deafness. But I said to him, what side effects does that have? He said, oh, it might take your hearing away. Did I want to take that? I couldn't see. Do I take a chance on being deaf as well? It's very, very hard. And I'm thankfully maybe exclusive. But I'm here just to say this is what can happen. Let's not make it happen very often. Thanks for listening.